Hello, I'm Tony Anadio, and in this lecture, I'd like to talk about the Middle Ages and how the church spread its dominance. So we have to take a look at, first, what do we really mean by the Middle Ages? Generally, historians date the Middle Ages from the fall of the Western Roman Empire in 476 AD. The last Roman emperor is overthrown. But Rome had been, the Roman Empire had been split in two um, a couple of times before this. So we really refer to the Western Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire will remain intact for another thousand years, falling in 1453 to the Ottoman Turks. The end of the Middle Ages is a little harder. Um, my personal preference is to end the Middle Ages at 1350. And the reason for that date is because that's the end of a particular wave of Black Death, which begins in 1347, ends in 1350. And to me, that just seems like a very good stopping point because a lot of things change after that. So if we look at this period, 476 to 1350, there's really in the West an absence of the Roman Empire. So the Roman Empire was this very strong, militarily powerful, centrally controlled authority. And that goes away. So in its place, what you saw were very small territories ruled by some person. So there's a, a lot of them scattered throughout Western Europe. But the church itself remains intact and continues to grow in the Middle Ages and sort of becomes an institution that functions like an empire. These territories wax and wane, they grow larger, they grow smaller, and so on. But we really want to look at, well, how does the church become the church? So we have to look at historical Christianity. And this is a very complex subject. So I'm not going to try to give you the, the entire history of Christianity, but if we consider originally Christianity is a sort of branch of Judaism where a number of people believe that Jesus was the Messiah. And subsequently there is a religion devoted to the teachings of Jesus. So that's really what we mean when we talk about Christianity. But Christianity is not monolithic. It is, as I like to describe it, it is different people in different places at different times with different ideas. You know, everybody has a different interpretation of what Christianity should be. Although, as I said, it centers on this notion that Jesus was the Messiah and we know his teaching. So that's really what we mean by, by Christianity. And you can't really understand Christianity apart from the Roman Empire. Christianity is very much anti-Roman. The, the values are, are very much opposed to what values the Romans themselves had. So it's monotheistic for one thing. The Romans were polytheistic. Um, the early Christians took oaths of poverty. The Romans were all about ostentatious displays of wealth. The Christians are pacifistic. They do not believe in violence. The Romans are very violent. And the Christians believed in this notion of heaven for the oppressed. Roman concepts of the afterlife are a bit more complicated, but it wasn't, they didn't really consider sort of heaven in the same way that the Christians did. So even though it's very much anti-Roman, Christianity begins to make inroads into the Roman Empire. And part of the reason for this is the nature of Christianity itself. And really, you might even say the nature of people itself or their selves. There's a lot of accommodations that Christianity makes, a lot of concessions. So for example, the early Christians as Jews were circumcised. And if you are trying to recruit followers, especially adult males, 
very few of them are going to line up to be circumcised in an era where there isn't any anesthesia. So one of the early concessions they make is from Paul, who says, you know, you don't really have to be circumcised. And if you can get around that, then more people will convert. And of course, this is a dispute between Peter and Paul, um, but that's another story. So when it gets to the Roman Empire, you know, what happens is that this promise of paradise is very powerful and not all Romans lived the high life. So many of them kind of identify with these messages of Christianity. And what happens is that in some instances they modify their behavior, their lifestyle to suit Christianity and they also modify Christianity to suit their lifestyle. So that's one way that, that, that Christianity becomes part of the Roman Empire. But Rome faced a crisis in the third century known as the crisis of the third century, whereby in one stretch of time, there was 33 years, there were 14 different emperors and only two of them die of natural causes. So by the time an emperor named Diocletian comes to power, at the end of the third century. He believes that the Roman Empire had become too large to govern, so he splits it in two, the eastern half um, and the western half. Furthermore, he sets up what's known as the Tetrarchy. This is what's known as the rule of four. So the way this works is that you have an emperor in the east, you have an emperor in the west. The emperor, each of these co-emperors would name an, a kind of understudy. And that way, when they died, their understudy would automatically become the emperor, and then they would name an understudy um, who would replace them eventually on their death. So this was supposed to solve the crisis of succession, which historically is always a problem in any dynasty. So you have this split you have this, this group of people in place that's going to solve the problems, but he, he also reinvigorates the cult of the emperor. You know, this is something that the Romans had as a tradition for a very long time where they would revere their dead emperors, the good ones, um, as deities. And it had kind of fallen out of use for a while. Um, so Diocletian reinvigorates it which of course is a problem for the Christians. Christians are monotheists. The rule was, or one of the rules, you had to offer up a pinch of incense for the emperor. And if you do that, as a Christian, you're violating the first commandment. Thou shalt have no gods before me. Now there were ways to get around this. You might hide, or you might bribe one of the officials to say, yeah, okay, they paid, you know, we're, we're, they, they offered up the incense. So, okay, that's a problem for the Christians, and those who didn't were persecuted. Okay, so what happens with Diocletian is he does something unprecedented. He decides to retire, and prior to this, no Roman emperor had ever retired. There's only one way out. It's like the mafia. You, know, you die, and that's it. So, but it's not a problem because the Tetrarchy is in place. However, as you might guess, Lots of people begin jockeying for power, and then they begin fighting each other. So his generals begin, you know, fighting each other for power, and um, two of them are Constantine and Maxentius. So the two men are going to do battle. It's the, the year is 312. The famous battle is known as the Battle of the Milvian Bridge. And even though Constantine is a pagan, his mother is Christian, but he's pagan. He sees this vision before the night of the battle of the Christian symbol, the key and the row. This is a, a Christian symbol, the first two letters of Jesus' name. And he hears this voice in this sign, conquer. The next day he orders his soldiers to emblazon this symbol on their shields. They do battle and win. The following year, in 313, Constantine will issue the Edict of Milan, which essentially legalized Christianity. He also orders the construction of a 
church for them to worship right in Rome. It becomes known as St. Peter's, the original St. Peter's. The one that stands today was a rebuild during the Renaissance. But what he builds is this very opulent Roman basilica for the Christians. So there are two kind of problems here. The earliest Christians were pacifist and took oaths of poverty. But here is Constantine basically saying, I will become a Christian so long as I can keep killing people and living in the lap of luxury. And of course, the Roman Christians are somewhat accustomed to living the sweet life, la dolce vita, as it's known in Rome. So this is one of those concessions, accommodations, that the church makes. And those are important because those political alliances are necessary. Okay, so we have the inroads of the Christians into the Roman Empire, but by 380, the Emperor Theodosius makes Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, which is very remarkable that it had gone from this Middle Eastern sect of Judaism that most Jews rejected to now the official religion of the biggest empire on the planet. Okay, so now we get to the Middle Ages. What had happened to the church in all of these concessions and all of this opulence, there were a number of people who believed that the church and society to become too worldly. And they retreat, they want to retreat from society. They want to live like Jesus lived. So they isolate themselves. They deprive themselves of comfort as a way to get nearer to heaven. And eventually these people find each other and start living in very small communities. And it's the start of what we call the monastic movement. Monasticism exists alongside the church in the Middle Ages and will become sort of allied with the church, even though many of them still believe that the church has gotten too worldly. So the monastic movement is one way that we can look at how the church spreads its dominance. But the church had become much more politically organized in the aftermath of Constantine um, particularly in 325 when he calls the Council of Nicaea, they straighten out what the essence of Jesus is. They determine the canon of the Bible. Um, the first you know, copies of the New Testament are written down, and suddenly there's a more orthodox view of Christianity. And of course, there has to be somebody in charge of it all, and at the time, that was the Bishop of Rome, who will eventually become the Pope. Now those bishops were always from very prominent families. However, in the monastic movement, those were sort of the dregs of society, or they could be the dregs of society. But the first monk that will rise to the rank of Pope is a man named Gregory the Great, who uh, becomes Pope at the end of the 6th century. He, even though he's from a very wealthy family, he had given all that up to, to become a monk. But his papacy is very significant for the spread of the church in the Middle Ages. He does two things. He decrees that the church should be missionary. In other words, they want to reach out to all of the pagans that are still around, and many of them are in Northern Europe. He does something else too. As a monk, these monks in their communities, <clears throat> they live together, they eat together, they pray together, and they work together. The work that they do is essentially copying manuscripts. They sit around all day and just copy books, literally letter by letter, page by page. And there were no printing presses, so this is how books were made. But as they prayed together, one of the traditions they had was that they would sing their prayers. They would chant. They thought that it pleased God. And the way that this worked, if you became a monk, an older monk would teach you the chants through the oral tradition. But 
Gregory was worried that those might be lost, so he decreed that the church should find some way to record, to notate that music. Now, it takes about 200 years for this to happen, but eventually the church will notate the music. And in honor of Pope Gregory, the person who decreed it, they will call these things Gregorian chants, which is where they get their name today. Now, because the monks were the ones writing down the books, of course, once they figure out music notation, they're going to write down music. And of course, the music they're going to write down is their own music. And of course, now they can make copies of that music and then spread that music throughout Europe, another way that the church can spread its dominance. Because for many people who are attending church, that might be the only place they ever get to hear music. And people like music, and if church is the only place, well then, that's going to have a lot of meaning for you. So that's Pope Gregory's great contributions in terms of art and, and architecture. Because as the church becomes sort of missionary, they begin building lots of little churches. You see these stone churches throughout Europe. And there's no particular architectural style to them. So that means that either the church didn't really want to have a, an orthodox architectural style, or they just weren't able to enforce it. But we start to see them spread throughout Europe. Even in the Eastern Roman Empire, where you know, they're still very powerful, one of the great emperors of the East is Justinian. He will order the construction of a building today known as the Hagia Sophia, then known as San Sophia. It was this square building with a giant dome on it. And the interior space was meant to sort of emulate what it would be like to enter heaven. You walk into the space, you see the dome and the light in this giant room, and you know it was supposed to uplift your spirit. So it's another way for the church to kind of you know, show how dominant it is and to impress people. But the church also reached out to these Germanic tribes. This term Germanic we use as a sort of catch-all. There were lots of these tribes in Europe. There's the Ostrogoths, the Visigoths, the Angles, the Saxons, the uh, Saxons, the Jutes, the Celts, the Picts, the Scots. There's hundreds of these, these tribes. But one of the early tribes that had settled into the Roman Empire were the Franks. And they had settled this territory, which today is France. Um, their leader is a man named Clovis, who was a pagan, had married a Christian woman. And he will eventually convert to Christianity. It's a very long story, but just from the church's perspective, when he converts, this is a very big deal for the church because they're essentially getting an army, and Clovis is essentially getting the sanction of the church. So this is another way for the church to kind of cement its, its dominance in Europe. But when we look at these Germanic tribes, we have to consider the art that, that characterizes them. And we can look at two particular motifs. One of them is known as the animal style. When we think about religion and art, if we think of the Christians, you know, what kind of animals do the Christians value? Of course, lambs and sheep and doves and things like that. Those are very common uh, in Christianity. These Germanic peoples were warriors. It's a warrior culture. They were the people that the Romans called barbarians. So the types of animals they value are vicious animals, birds of prey and the like. That's one form. We call it the animal style. The other motif we see in Germanic art is known as strap work. Although sometimes it has another name, it can be called insular art or Celtic art. But it's this kind of interwoven vine-like motif that, that you see in a lot of, of that period's art. So these two things characterize Germanic art. Now, when we look at the monks who are transcribing these manuscripts and they're trying to convert the pagans, these pagans are mostly illiterate in Northern Europe. I mean, they can't even read their own language half the time. 
So they're not going to be able to read Latin. So if you're going to try to convert them to Christianity and you have a Bible, you know, they're not going to learn Latin and then sit down and read your Bible. You need to appeal to them with art. This is why art is so powerful. So what we begin to see is these, German, or these monks, some of them Germanic, begin using these artistic motifs in Bibles. So we see strap work. We see even in particular, there's an excellent example of a frontispiece for the Gospel of St. John, which is depicted with a lion. And so when they can see these vicious animals and these artistic motifs that they already associate with their culture, it's one way to convince them to convert. Now, as long as they can keep killing people and engage in warfare and get their booty and divvy up the booty and so on, sure, they'll be Christians, you know, as long as they can maintain that lifestyle. And of course, this is also a benefit for the church because, you know, part of that money will come back to the church. So, by using the illuminated manuscripts, you know, it's again another way for the church to, to spread its dominance. But I mentioned earlier that there really aren't any real empires in the Middle Ages, but there is a couple of exceptions. You could consider the church an empire, but the one real empire is the empire of Charlemagne. Um, Charlemagne has this um, religious upbringing. His father was a king. Um, he and his brother are co-rulers, but then suddenly his brother dies and Charlemagne is, is left in control. He's a very successful warrior. He goes on some 53 campaigns in all, never loses. Uh, with one tiny exception on a retreat to deal with the Saxons, um, his rear guard is wiped out at a place called Roncevalle on the border of France and Spain is really the only defeat he ever suffers. So he amasses this very large territory in today what would be the Netherlands all the way down to the top of Italy. Mostly Germany, Austria, what would, would today be those countries. So he amasses this very large empire and he is deeply Christian, the type of Christian who when, encounter, in, when he encounters the Saxons who are pagan offers them the choice, convert or die, and when they refuse to convert, he executes some 4,500 of them in one day. So he's a very, very serious Christian. And of course, the church has this very powerful army. So Charlemagne, though, in his empire, he does a lot of things. He, he emphasizes education. He wants this empire to be successful and he realizes you have to have people who know how to think. So that requires education. So where is he going to find educated peoples? There's really only one place, the monasteries. They're literate, they have the books. So he begins recruiting monks from all over Europe to come to his court in Aachen, which is in Germany today. He also reconstitutes a cash economy. And this is significant for a couple of reasons. The Romans had a cash economy, and there was still a cash economy in the, in the aftermath of the Roman Empire. But you really need a very strong central government to ensure that the money is sound, or at least as far as you can get sound money from a government. But with that, cash economy, now there is money for building. In Western Europe, from the fall of the Roman Empire until Charlemagne, there's not a lot of large-scale construction. It's certainly nowhere near what the Romans did. But now with this cash economy, we start to see lots of buildings. And what did they build? Churches. What was the last style they built in? Roman. So, this period is known as Romanesque. Romanesque architecture is a lot of arches. And they begin constructing arches one after another. And when you have one after another, you essentially create what's known as a barrel vault. So these barrel vaults are very heavy. So the walls are really important to holding up the ceiling. 
So if you want to build a very high building, a very tall building, you need very, very thick walls because otherwise it would collapse. And this imposes a bit of a limit on how high you can build because the higher you go, the thicker the walls get and eventually the first floor will disappear. So Romanesque architecture begins to proliferate throughout Europe. But there are some architectural advances. In fact, there are three of them which come along, which radically transform the way buildings are built. The first is known as ribbed vaulting. So instead of having arch after arch after arch in what looks like a tunnel, essentially you build a cross section and then you fill in that, those spaces with cement. It's much, much lighter and it's much stronger. So if you're going to remove that much weight from the ceiling, then you can build even higher because you've reduced the weight. The second innovation is a flying buttress. So I mentioned in an earlier video that when you have the force of gravity pushing down on something, the earth will stop it, but it actually redirects the forces out. So when those forces are directed out, you have to sort of counter them. And so if I am going to hold up a wall, I might stand like this to hold up the wall. And essentially what I am at that moment is a flying buttress. So the flying buttress is a way to keep the walls up. So you have ribbed vaulting, flying buttresses. Now you can build even higher. The third innovation comes around 1144 at a place called Saint-Denis. Their abbot, a man named Suget, wanted a new choir built in the church. And for this choir, they create a new type of arch. In architecture, the strongest architectural shape is a triangle. Arches are very strong, but Triangles are even stronger. That's why most roofs are in the shape of a triangle. However, this new innovation was a pointed arch. Sometimes we call it the Gothic arch. And it's essentially, if you take an arch and kind of mix it with a triangle, that's what you get. So it's actually stronger than a regular arch. Those three things together created what we now call Gothic architecture. And they allow for a radically different way to build a building because now you don't need the walls at all to hold up the building. Essentially, what you are doing is building a frame. And that's really how we build today. Watch any building go up. They build a frame and then they put the walls around it. So if you are building a frame and using these three techniques, you can actually build on a much, much higher scale, which they do. But what this, the advantage this gives you is that if you don't need the walls for support, then you can basically fill them with anything. And one of the things they fill these walls with is glass. So we see the great age of cathedral building and stained glass architecture. Okay, so we have this new type of architecture which should have been stunning to anybody. You would think that people who walk into the building would be deeply impressed, but the Italians weren't always impressed with it. And it, in fact, it got its name Gothic in the Renaissance be, as a term of derision. You know, well, that's a Gothic style, the Northerners, you know, those Ostrogoths and Visigoths, you know, they didn't like, they preferred the arches. But everyone else kind of liked that style. And they began, we, you begin to see them used in cathedrals. So I have to explain first that a cathedral is simply the seat of the bishop. It derives from the Latin word cathedra, which means seat. It's not a style. As Sometimes people think today. It's just that the bishops had the money. <laughs> they had a lot of money and they could afford to build on that scale. So if we look at cathedrals now as a way for the church to spread its dominance, 
we can look at a few different things. Um, for one, these are usually the biggest, tallest, most important buildings in any community. They are places of spirituality. They are places of sanctuary. They are places of salvation. They are places of charity, places of business, politics, and most importantly, you might say, is employment. Many of these cathedrals take more than a hundred years to build. Generations of families work on them. And when you can position yourself in a community that way, you are going to be the dominant force in that community. And especially with all of the alliances the church had made with various political figures. Now, those aren't always smooth. There's a lot of clashes and things like that. But for the most part, they each have similar ideas. They have similar goals. They, you know, want the population to be, you know, controlled and prosperous. So they often worked together. So these cathedrals as a building also underscore what their, their sort of emotional purpose is. When you walk into a cathedral, it is supposed to be like walking into heaven. It's supposed to uplift your spirit. And there's this common take that it's supposed to make you feel small and worthless and all that, and that's not entirely accurate. Um, they were really meant to uplift you and to impress you. Any institution that could do that is very powerful and must be doing something right. But what they also underscore is essentially the monopoly that the church had on salvation. In the Middle Ages, the Renaissance, and you might even argue to today for a religious person, the most important thing of all is salvation, right? Life is relatively short, so you want to make sure you go to heaven. And the church basically stated that you got to heaven by doing four things. First, go to church. Second, do the sacraments. Third, tithe, 10% of your wealth to the church. Don't forget the money. And then lastly, do good deeds. So in a sense, the only way you could get to heaven was through the church. And if you wanted salvation, then you had to go through the church. So these are just a few of the ways that the church spread its dominance in the Middle Ages. And what we see is that from the beginning of the Middle Ages to the end of the Middle Ages, the church had become this enormously large and powerful institution, which continues to this day, although today it is powerful in different ways. Thanks for listening.